Very well, thank you so much. Thank you for your welcome. And it's such a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, let me congratulate you on your planning. Uh, I think this engagement has been in the diary for at least a year, possibly a year and a half. And um, it's great to see you anticipating um, the fact that uh, this is going to be a year of a general election. In fact, it's going to be a year of general elections, plural, the UK, the US and India, which, of course, is the world's most populous nation, are just three of the countries that are set to hold elections throughout the course of this year, 2024. That's more than two billion people across 50 countries um, heading to the polls in the coming year, which is a record high, uh, which is extraordinary. So it's very good to be able to be with you to explore this theme of who gets my vote and why, how we should think about politics from a Christian perspective. In the course of the evening, I'll tell you a little bit about my own story into and through politics. Um, but let me just kick off by um, telling you a little bit about LICC. For those of you who are less familiar with us, um, LICC, the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, was established by John Stott in 1982 and others. And the intention at the outset that remains the focus today was to help people relate the gospel to all of life, recognizing that there is no part of life, and of course that includes politics, that God is not interested in and the good news of Jesus Christ does not apply to, it's not relevant to. And so the life of the Christian is about living life in the kingdom and applying the life of the kingdom to the totality of everything. And that is the focus of our work at LICC. We seek to inspire and equip people to relate the Christian faith to every part of life. And we have a particular focus on those aged 18 to 35. And there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is that 75% of young adults who are raised in Christian homes have left church by the age of 35. And that's a staggering statistic. It's a painful statistic because, of course, behind those statistics are real people, real lives, real churches. Um, but what's interesting about that is the majority of those leaving church don't leave because they've rejected Christianity as untrue or because they've stopped believing in God. They've left because they often don't feel able to connect what's happening on a Sunday with their everyday lives and concerns. And that should give us cause to, to focus on what we would describe at LICC as a whole life discipleship agenda mission. The fact that Jesus calls us to live all of life with him in the present and navigate all of life uh, with him and with his help and with his wisdom. So that's a little bit about LICC. And if you want to know more, um, do have a look on the website and uh, hopefully there'll be some resources there that are helpful to you. Um, now, this evening, if you I think that I'm going to um, attempt to tell you how to vote, um, I'm going to disappoint you. Um, not that quite rightly you would pay any attention to what I said on that subject in any case, but I am going to outline this evening what I think we should think about as Christians in deciding who to vote for. And I very much look forward to listening to your, your comments and asking any answering any questions that you have after I've spoken. So my um, plan is to speak for a little while um, and then to take your questions and comments. And then along the way, I thought it'd be quite good fun if we had an opportunity to hear from each other. And the principal way that we'll do that is through the chat function on Zoom. So hopefully you're familiar with that. And that allows you to um, tap in a little message uh, in response maybe to some of the questions that I pose to you. So I hope that sounds like a good plan. If uh, you're in agreement with that, um, please, please indicate in the usual way. Maybe a nod or two would uh, be a oh, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. And a thumbs up. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to uh, talking with you this evening. Um, incidentally, if you want to explore some of these questions in further depth, uh, let me invite you to... Um, uh, seek out uh, a podcast uh, that we have recently launched. 
Um, this podcast uh, is entitled The Whole Life uh, for reasons that hopefully um, make sense in light of what I've already said. And uh, this is a podcast that was launched um, just at the beginning of the year. A new episode is released every fortnight. And uh, the aim of this really is to explore the connection between the Christian story and all of life. That includes politics. In fact, the first episode is on politics. It's entitled, Can Christianity Fix Our Broken Politics? So if that's uh, of interest, and if you're used to accessing podcasts, you can access this on Spotify or iTunes, on YouTube or Google. Um, do take a look at that, particularly the first episode. That will go into a bit more depth, um, some of what I'm describing here. And it uh, features a special guest, Luke Bretherton, who um, is a real specialist in this area. He uh, is based both in the US and in the UK. And therefore, there's uh, an interesting part of the conversation is around exploring the difference uh, between those two contexts. So that's the Whole Life podcast. I should say, by way of introduction this evening, that I'm speaking to you not far away. Uh, I'm in Swindon this evening. And uh, Swindon is interesting, um, for those of you who know it, for a whole number of reasons. Uh, firstly, it is statistically the most average place to live in the UK, which is a remarkable fact, which makes it very significant missionally, obviously. Um, in fact, to the extent that Waitrose have a concept store in Swindon, and the idea is if a product sells in Swindon, it's likely to sell anywhere else in the country. So there was huge excitement in Swindon when Waitrose opened a few years ago. The fact that it is average is also a reason why it's a very significant marginal seat. Swindon is at the moment blue, but it needs to turn uh, red if Keir Starmer has any chance of becoming prime minister. And the good news for Keir Starmer is that in line with other national opinion polls, uh, Swindon did turn red in the council elections. So if that's any barometer, any indicator of what will happen in the general election, it looks like uh, Swindon will turn Labour and uh, it looks like uh, Keir Starmer will enter number 10. In addition, uh, though, to being a marginal seat, Swindon is the birthplace of the NHS. It is the location of the world's first lending library. And it is also, of course, the site of Brunel's great railway works. It is also, uh, for those of you who have visited and for those of you who are avid viewers of Have I Got News For You, it is the site of the magic roundabout. This was constructed in 1972, and it consists of five mini roundabouts, as you can see here, that are organized around a sixth central anti-clockwise roundabout, uh, which means that, uh, well, like the magic roundabout, faith and politics is often tricky to navigate. And uh, I hope this evening that we'll be able to navigate that uh, well and in a way that is, is faithful uh, to scripture. It is also, Swindon is also the place by all accounts where there um, is no crime, at least between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So if you're going to visit Swindon, do try and visit during those hours and uh, you'll, be, um, you'll be in safe hands. But let me begin with a question to you. This is why I'd love to um, hear your thoughts. If I say the word politics, um, what are the words that you immediately think of? Um, so this is uh, uh, a game of word association. If I say the pol word politics, what are the words uh, that you associate with that? Perhaps you would um, just put those into, into the chat function uh, so we can have a look at those. Uh, dysfunctional, untrustworthy. This is very good. I mean, it's not very good, obviously, but it's very good to see your contributions. Push for power, boring, lying, yep, distrust, dodgy, important. Let's uh, let it run for a few more seconds, see if anyone else, government. Boring. Broken, yeah, interesting. Opinion, strife. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. No real difference. That is interesting. Now, this is um, uh, confrontational. Brilliant. We will end it there. Thank you so much. Um, what's really interesting about that is I was going to say, that obviously, this is not a scientific survey, but um, in your own way, you are a focus group. And what's interesting about that is I would say that out of all the words that were suggested there, uh, probably 85 to 90 percent of those words were negative words. So they were words like boring and uh, destructive and broken. Um, there were a few neutral words in there, um, like government. Um, and maybe there were a few positive words in there, like important. Um, but it is an interesting fact that on the whole, people's view of politics and their view of politicians is very negative. And over the last 25 years, the public's view of politics and politicians has only deteriorated. And there have been particular points uh, triggered by particular events. One classic example would be the expenses scandal that really formed, perhaps reformed, people's perception of politics and politicians. Um, and therefore, it's, I think, all the more important that we seek to frame politics, understand politics uh, from a Christian perspective, and therefore seek to navigate it on those terms. Um, let me give you a little bit about my personal story as a way of um, uh, navigating uh, through this subject this evening. This is uh, Ruth and my children. Um, I'm married to Ruth and we have four children. Uh, you can see them there. Otis is the youngest. He is four. Um, then there's Esther, who is seven. There's Atticus, who is 11. And there is Amos, who is 13. And uh, they're all they're all lively and they all have opinions. And occasionally that we talk about politics. Um, but I often um, compare and contrast, if you like, their upbringing and the sorts of conversations that we have uh, with the sorts of conversations I had with my parents and my siblings as I was growing up. And one of the things that uh, strikes me as I look back uh, on my own childhood was um, how political it was in lots of different ways. That is not to say that my parents were card-carrying uh, members of political parties, um, but it is to say that when we were talking, and we would talk a lot, I was one of six children, I am one of six children, and therefore our discussion was often lively, and it was often difficult to get an edge, word in edgeways. It was often perhaps a bit like the House of Commons, in fact. Um, uh, often the subject focused on current affairs, often it focused on politics. And as I grew up, I had a real fascination with politics. I remember probably my earliest political memory is of seeing um, Dennis Healy, who was just about to finish his term as Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was on a television program, and um, I remember seeing him. And then I remember um, probably in terms of my first general election that I kind of can remember was the 83 general election uh, between Michael Foote was the leader of the Labour Party, and Margaret Thatcher was uh, Prime Minister and seeking re-election as Conservative Party leader. Um, and I remember that being a significant election, and I remember my parents being quite interested in it and engaged in it, to the extent that I remember being sick and off school one day, but um, I was uh, required um, by my mum to accompany her to deliver leaflets for this general election. I won't tell you who she was delivering leaflets for, um, but it really mattered um, to my parents. The outcome of the election mattered to them. Um, so that was the sort of context I grew up in. I visited Parliament. My first visit to Parliament was at the age of 10. I expressed interest to my parents in visiting Parliament, and uh, uh, they wrote to our local MP, and as a result of that, I got a ticket to visit Parliament and to watch Prime Minister's Question Time. And by that stage, uh, Michael Foote had uh, left as leader of the Labour Party. Neil Kinnock was leading the Labour Party, and it was Kinnock and Thatcher at the dispatch boxes. Uh, the two Davids, if you remember them, were leading the SDP Liberal Alliance. Um, and that was that was an extraordinary visit. I, I, I still remember um, the the kind of sense of uh, occasion that that was. Not least because it coincided with the state opening 
of Parliament. And so I was able to uh, see um, all of that happen and, and get a real sense of history that was associated with that. And also, I think, a sense of um, the privilege of living in a democracy, the fact that as a result of um, the vote of my parents and those over 18, um, that they could decide who who governed them. I thought that was an extraordinary thing, even at a young age. Um, so I continued that interest in politics. I had another visit uh, to Parliament um, a few years later and uh, went obviously continued through school, left school, went to study theology. And then after studying theology, my first job was as a parliamentary researcher working for an MP in the House of Commons. And for me, there was a, a, a real logic to having studied theology and then doing politics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it seemed to me that that was an entirely natural journey um, whereas if I look back, I can see that um, the majority of my peers, my colleagues who were working in Parliament, they'd often done history or they had done politics or they'd done economics. Um, but I don't think I ever came across anyone who'd done theology. Um, but for me, it, it seemed logical. It seemed natural that if you did theology, you might then end up working within a political environment like Parliament. Um, so it was a great job. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed um, well writing letters. I drafted speeches, attended meetings. I answered the telephone. On Wednesdays, I'd often go into the chamber, the public gallery of the, the House of um, Commons to watch Prime Minister's Question Time. By that stage, it was Tony Blair and William Hague, who were um, Prime Minister and leader of the opposition. And that was great theatre often had very little impact on the world outside of Parliament, but someone interested in politics, it was great theatre. Both of them were very strong performers. There were aspects to the role that I had that I didn't enjoy quite so much. I made an awful lot of tea and did an awful lot of photocopying and did a great deal of filing. Um, but that was a great environment to, to be formed in, um, both in terms of um, generally, in terms of my growth and development, but of course, if as someone who was interested in politics, it was a great environment to be formed in. And one of the things that um, always struck me in Parliament was the extent to which the architecture of Parliament, as well as the workings of Parliament, connected with the Christian story. Let me give a very practical example of this. Um, so this is a painting in Parliament. This is in part of Parliament known as St. Stephen's Hall. So St. Stephen's Hall leads into the central lobby of the Houses of Parliament. Central lobby is where historically constituents would lobby their member of Parliament. And it remains the, the right of every subject of the United Kingdom to enter central lobby and to ask for their MP, to lobby their MP. On the way into central lobby, on the left, you pass this painting, this fresco. And this fresco, this painting is known, its name is the English people reading Wycliffe's Bible. It's one of eight canvases that were commissioned at the beginning of the 20th century to fill vacant spaces on the walls in St. Stephen's Hall. And uh, the interesting thing about this painting is you can see this group of people uh, in England and they're reading Wycliffe's Bible. And if you look closely, you can see one or two of the characters looking over their shoulders, uh, looking further away just to check that they're not being spied on. And that draws attention to the radical nature of scripture, um, the idea and the concern uh, that those in power had that if people could read the Bible in their own language, in the English language, um, that that might uh, result in a challenge to those in political power, those holding power. And I think it remains an important reminder for us today that there is a connection between the Christian faith and everything else, politics included, um, and that if we take scripture really seriously, if we take um, the gospel of Jesus Christ really seriously, that that's not safe. It's it's transformative, not only at a personal level, but also at a societal level. Um, I, I love the, the little line in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where the children discover for the first time that Aslan is a lion, not a human being. 
And one of the children, Susan, asks the beaver about this and then asks the question, is Aslan safe? I mean, if Aslan's a lion, is he safe? And the response of the beavers is safe. Of course, he's not safe, uh, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And I think it's important for us to recover the idea that was understood in this painting that scripture is not safe, it's good. If we take scripture really seriously, it should radically transform the way not only we see the world, but the way that we engage in it. And it seems to me a, a remarkable thing that this painting is where it is, almost in the center of parliament. If you look, walk then a little bit further past this painting into central lobby, you can see carved into the floor of Central Lobby, the words from the psalm, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labour in vain, which is another reminder, this time at the very centre of Parliament, that ultimately those in political office, those in power, those who take decisions are ultimately accountable to, to God, to the God of the universe. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that in the architecture of our politics, as well as in the way that politics is conducted still, there are those signs, those links, those connections with the Christian story. Well, after I um, studied politics and uh, then, well, or worked in politics, I should say, having studied theology, um, I then worked in politics and public affairs for a while. Um, and then in 2005, established a think tank uh, called Theos, um, that uh, was and remains committed to bringing a Christian reflection to social and political issues, cultural issues in our day. And then after Theos, I worked for 10 years at Bible Society. And uh, there, there was that connection between Bible and society and seeking not only to offer the Bible to the world, but seeking to um, offer the Bible to our own contemporary culture and, and find different ways of doing that. And then after Bible Society, for the last three years, I've been at LICC. And of course, LICC is all about seeking to integrate the gospel with all of life. Um, so I need you to know, as I talk about um, politics this evening, as we seek to frame that uh, through a, a Christian lens, um, that that's where I'm coming from, that that has been part of my story. And um, I'm very happy to talk more about that and answer any questions that you have um, in due course. But I want to uh, spend a little bit of time now, if I may, just sketching out what we might describe as a bit of a, a theology of politics, um, some foundations that might help us as we think not only about politics in general terms, but as we think specifically about the upcoming general election. And the way that I want to do that is to go through some of the acts of scripture, what's sometimes referred to as the drama of scripture, and look at the relevance of each of those acts for political life and for the election. So um, first off, act one, obviously the act of creation. God creates planet Earth, God creates the universe. And uh, the the high point of that creative act is the creation of human beings. And therefore, we see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 um, that God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Right at the start of Scripture, in this first act, um, I want to suggest to us this evening um, that there is something about politics here, that God has created human beings to be stewards, to rule over planet Earth, and that involves politics. Politics is about how we organize our common life together. And so right at the beginning, 
even before sin enters the world, there is a sense in which politics in some way is relevant and part and parcel of our human vocation. In some ways, part of being human is about being political. We have been created to look after planet Earth as God's representatives, to reflect God's image, God's likeness into all the world. Uh, politics is about organizing our economic and our social and our cultural life. And uh, one of the theologians historically who recognized this was a theologian called Aquinas. And he argued that um, government is good, that it's part of God's created order. And I would want to suggest to us this evening that in the same way that prayer was part and parcel of the human experience before sin entered the world, so politics was part and parcel of the human experience before sin entered the world. And we might want to talk a little bit about that later on. So that is Act 1. And we can see in that that there is a positive role that government has to play within culture. And that's picked up in a couple of New Testament passages. Um, this is from Romans 13. This idea that we are to be subject to governing authorities um, because in some way God has, a, has established political authority, that it has a role, a purpose. Um, but those authorities have been established. They exist to do good. Um, so there is something in Romans 13 about the positive role of government and of politics. And similarly, in Paul's letter to Timothy, in chapter 2, this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, Paul um, encourages his readers to pray um, for those in positions of leadership, for those in authority. And the, the aim, the ob objective of the prayer is that those in authority might rule wisely in order that the rest of us might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I wonder, and I'd be interested in doing a little poll amongst the group this evening, um, to what extent any of us follow this commandment that Paul gives Timothy to pray for those in leadership. I wonder if you can just think a, a moment and think about the last time that you prayed for those in government, uh, for those who are pol politicians. Um, when was the last time in the context of a church service um, that you prayed um, it strikes me, and of course you're probably exceptional, and the fact that you are part of this meeting this evening, I'm sure suggests that you are, um, but it strikes me that this is one of the uh, encouragements that's given in the New Testament, that the majority of Christians, the majority of time, the time, uh, fail to follow through on. It's one of the instructions that is often completely ignored. Um, and I want to suggest this evening that we might change that. We might do something about that. So that's the first act, act of creation. Uh, let's go on to the second act, because as we know, it all goes wrong. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't stay like that. Uh, sin enters the world and uh, human beings rebel against God. And the consequences of that rebellion are catastrophic not only for those individual human beings, but for human beings ever since, and for the wider world. And I think there's a reminder then here to us that one of the functions of politics, one of the functions of governments is to restrain evil, um, certainly the worst excesses of it. One of the the functions of government is to judge evil, to name that which is wrong and to, to deal with it, to judge it, to, uh, to address it. Um, there is a, if you like, a negative aspect to politics, which is about a kind of a restraining force that uh, political power has to play. Um, and that's something I think that we kind of need to be mindful of in, in every context and in every generation. 
And we see the way this idea then is picked up by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, where he outlines this idea that those who have political authority, those in positions of power, are in some ways God's servants, got agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Um, and if government uh, fails to address that which is wrong, um, and if government uh, uh, sees that which is wrong but calls it right, that then I would suggest is a, a, a moral failure on the part of government, and government is not acting in the way that God has intended it to be. So as we approach the coming election, we might think, well, which political party um, is is most likely to restrain the worst excesses of human nature? Um, or if we go back to Act One, we might wonder w which political party is most likely to have a, a vision of human flourishing and, and the common good and have policies in place that uh, enable that and encourage that. Um, two things we might think about in relation to those two acts as we approach the next general election. Then we come to um, Act 3. And of course, this is the act where um, in the Old Testament, and of course, this extends into the New Testament, but the people of God who become the people of God, um, so the Israelites, they are invited to join in God's great project, the reconciliation and renewal of all things. And the idea in Act 3 is that God's people are to experience the life that God has called them to, and that that would not only be a blessing to them, but it would be a blessing to the entire world as they live as God's people. And we see that that is a theme that's picked up even in the context of exile. Um, so here we have uh, the situation of exile. <laughs> it's difficult to overstate how catastrophic exile was for people of God, but the encouragement, the commandment, to those in exile is to seek the peace and prosperity of the city. So even Babylon, into which they've been carried, and they're to pray to God for the city, because if it prospers, they too will prosper. Um, they're to seek the peace of the city. Um, there's a reminder there that, that that word peace is shalom. So deep peace, deep wholeness, the contentment, the welfare of the city, because within its welfare, the people will discover their own welfare. Um, so I think, again, that is a, an opportunity and challenge for us as we think about the next election, to think about how do we uh, seek the peace and prosperity of the cities, the constituencies, the places in which God has put us, and to remind ourselves that if God's people in Babylon were commanded to act in such a way, then that presumably applies to our context in 2024, which is really nothing like Babylon. Um, we have it infinitely easier in all sorts of ways. But if that is God's commandment to the people then, then it presumably extends to us today. Uh, we might ask the question ahead of the election, which is the party um, that will uh, work in such a way that allows God's people um, to do their work, that allows civil society groups to make their contribution in order that the welfare of the city, uh, the welfare of our culture uh, might be sought, might be promoted, might be extended. And then we've got uh, Act 4 and 5, and uh, this commandment of Jesus, when he's asked which is the greatest commandment, um, the answer uh, becomes very clear uh, that God's people are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbours as ourselves. And I want to suggest to us that if we're serious about loving God and if we're serious about loving our neighbours as ourselves, um, being aware of what's happening politically and using our influence positively is a necessity. It's It's not an option. Um, it's a requirement. It's it's part of what it means to love God and love our neighbours as ourselves. Uh, when I was working in politics, I was working in politics with the real conviction that if I was serious about following these two great commandments, then it was logical that I worked in a political environment 
uh, that had an impact on the lives of my neighbors, especially those who were vulnerable and those who are most disadvantaged. And of course, as part of these Acts 4 and 5, so Jesus and the, the church, um, we see that Jesus is asked very specifically about um, someone in political authority, um, Caesar. And uh, although these words that Jesus uh, used have sometimes been used to suggest that faith and politics should have nothing to do with each other, actually what Jesus is saying in these words is that there, there is an authority that belongs to Caesar. Caesar has some legitimate political authority, but that ultimately Caesar's authority is subject to God's, that ultimately God is in charge, um, and ultimately presidents and prime ministers and even Caesar are accountable to God for the way they use their power. I think sometimes it's helpful for us then to think about the context in which Jesus lived in the first century. And Jesus, he articulates his message, the fact that the kingdom of God is near, God's kingdom is at hand. And he does that in the context where there are all sorts of interesting groups with all sorts of alternative agendas. So there are the Pharisees who are committed to seeing God's kingdom come uh, through intensifying the requirements of the Old Testament law. Uh, there are the zealots who are trying to bring about God's kingdom through violent means, through resolve, uh, resolve to, to uh, military means. Um, there are the priests who see the temple as being the focus and that that is where the kingdom of God will come. That is the means by which it will come. There were the Herodians who basically compromised with the Romans and were in it for personal gain. And then there were the Essenes who withdrew out of society completely into the desert to form a separate community. And it strikes me that as we look at those groups in the first century, um, sometimes we can see the response of Christians uh, to politics today, that there are those who are a bit like the Essenes who withdraw into the desert and want nothing to do with it. And then there are sometimes those who are a bit like the Zealots who don't necessarily uh, uh, take up arms, um, but come close to it. And then there are those that are just up, utterly compromised by the whole thing. But of course, the challenge of Jesus is to live very differently. And the kingdom of God that Jesus announces is something that has implications uh, for politics, but is a kingdom that cannot be brought into being through political action. So the kingdom of Jesus is one that brings freedom uh, one into which all are welcome. It's a kingdom of celebration. It's a kingdom of love of God and neighbor. It's a kingdom into which anyone can come. No one is forced into it. Anyone can leave at any time. Um, it's a kingdom of infinite mutual forgiveness. And it's a kingdom into which right behavior comes from repentance and faith in God. And it's a kingdom which is led and lives by the spirit of God, not by violence or coercion or persecution. Um, it is easy sometimes for us, I think, to confuse um, the kingdom of God with politics. And we should never confuse those two things. We should recognize that the Christian faith has implications for how we do our politics. But ultimately, the kingdom of God uh, doesn't happen through political power. Um, and then, of course, we've got this last amazing final act of, of scripture, uh, where there's a new heaven and a new earth, where everything is made new. And I love those words from Revelation chapter 11. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. This promise of a future where God is king and uh, God is in charge and God is seen to be in charge and every knee will bow. Um, those in power will bow uh, before the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. So that's a little sort of very brief. And by the way, you're very welcome to have these slides if they're helpful, but sort of um, framing that I, I hope is helpful for us as we just think about um, politics, as we think about the election and some of the, 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 if you like, the theological foundations that we might draw upon um, as we approach polling day. 
Um, and I thought it'd be just helpful as we, we end this section to think about some of the ways in which we can very practically make a difference. And then I thought it'd be helpful in our discussion time um, to uh, go into some of the perhaps practical implications of some of what I've talked about in terms of how might that shape our decisions, how might that inform us. So let me give some suggestions <laughs> of ways in which we can make a difference. And the first is uh, one that I've already spoken about, but is to pray for those in positions of political authority. Um, it is absolutely right that our political culture is fractured, it is broken. Levels of trust in confidence are at record lows. Um, but we're, we're commanded to pray for those in positions of political power. And uh, we believe that prayer makes a difference. It not only changes us, but God works in and through our prayers to change the world around us. So if we're concerned about politics and if we want to see um, a, an election campaign that is better than it might otherwise be, let's pray and see that as being a very real practical action, even political action that we can take. Let's pray that God's kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven, that uh, we have a, a good election campaign and that we're able to see the issues and cut through some of the nonsense that always exists in these things. Um, secondly, there's an encouragement for us to get informed. It's quite hard to pray for what's happening in our politics unless we're informed about it. Um, so it's good to to see the news, to, to hear it, to read it, um, and to um, try and get a, a healthy view of what's going on. So if we tend to be um, more on the left of politics, then from time to time, it's quite good to read something that is coming from a uh, a right or centre-right position. If you're on the, the right of politics, then from time to time, it's quite good to pick up The Guardian and, and get a different perspective um, to so that we can listen to, to what is happening within our political culture, get informed. Uh, the third action might seem obvious, but it's to vote. Um, uh, voting levels are uh, historically relatively low, um, but each of us has uh, the opportunity to vote. And it's important always to recognise that if we choose not to vote, we are also influencing the outcome of an election. Um, that's true regardless of the constituency that we're in. But if we think of a constituency like Swindon, that's a marginal seat, if I choose not to vote, uh, not to use my vote for a particular candidate, then that candidate is less likely to win. Um, and the other candidate might. So use use your vote, use it wisely and recognise that if you don't use your vote, you have also contributed to the outcome in some way. You have influenced things in some way. Um, here's a very controversial one. I'll be interested in a moment to find out um, uh, uh, how many of you are members of political parties. But it is a fact, it remains a fact, that there are more members of the Royal Society for the Protection for Birds than there are in all the UK political parties put together. Uh, now, that is, in a way, extraordinary, isn't it? Um, why is it that we're so reluctant to join a political party? Um, I, would, I would encourage us to think about that. Um, that is a way that uh, you can influence what happens in politics. By the way, you don't need to agree with everything that the political party you join stands for. In fact, I'd be very surprised if you did. Um, but it's good to think, well, which is the political party that most closely represents me? And to join and to, to use your membership to make a difference within that political party. And then finally, uh, here's a very practical action. Um, stand for elected office. That could be to stand as a school governor. I've been a school governor for a number of years. And I think that gives you a real opportunity to influence what happens in the school that you have responsibility for. And that that's a sort of politics or we'll stand for the parish council or for the local government elections. <laughs> or ultimately, you might consider standing for parliament 
Um, the reality is that MPs, unbelievably, are ordinary people um, and they have to come from somewhere. Um, so it wouldn't be extraordinary if an increasing number of people um, uh, joined political parties right across the political parties who were driven um, by a commitment to loving God and loving their neighbour as themselves. Wouldn't that change our political landscape? Wouldn't that change the nature of our politics? Um, so there's a few ideas uh, for uh, getting involved. Um, obviously, they include voting at the election, but it's not limited to voting at the election. Politics is about so much more than that.